Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And before I begin this week's podcast, I'd just like to point out I'm celebrating 200 episodes of this podcast. So this is the 200th uh, episode, which is, um, uh, look, when I look back on it, I think it's a pretty good achievement. Uh, It's been going around about four years. Uh, I reckon I've written over 250,000 words, which is really equivalent to five books over the last four years. Recorded over 60 hours of podcast, and that's taken me well over a, a thousand hours to prepare. So I hope you've got a lot of value and out of the content. I hope you continue to listen. And, and really the best compliment you can pay me if you do enjoy it is to share the podcast and encourage other people to listen. Uh, the more the merrier, of course, and I'm very much looking forward to sharing the next 200 episodes Uh, with you. So anyway, without further ado, let's get into this week's episode, which is really about superannuation and what your options are when you retire. Because obviously, we're all um, uh, forced to invest in super, you know, make those compulsory contributions, which are 10% of our salary will be increased to 10.5% soon and make its way to 12%. So we're putting a lot of income in there. And we know, okay, that's for retirement savings, but it's really important to understand how does it actually help you retire? How do you draw on your super and how does it all work? And I thought I'd uh, do a podcast on this subject because whilst it is quite a complex area, I mean, superannuation is a very complex area. Uh, it is that the basics are rel- relatively easy to understand, I think. Um, and it's good to conceptualize, you know, how super will play a role in funding your retirement and if there's a shortfall so if it's not going to fund all your living expenses then of course you need to make other investments outside super which is true for I think most people listening to this podcast Um, but to what extent uh, of course depends on you know how much super is going to fund Uh, and you don't really you can't make that assessment unless you really understand how it works so a long preamble but really about super and how, how it works when you reach retirement. Now, of course, just like in every episode, I don't know your individual circumstances. Um, I can make uh, generalizations about super rules. There's, there's always exceptions, uh, just unlike any law, uh, exceptions uh, to, to lots of rules. And also, um, some super funds will have their own rules, you know, that they, and they can do that. So, uh, of course, it's important to get your own independent advice. And, and what I'm about to explain to you over the next period of time Uh, is I'm making some generalizations. I have to do that. Okay, so let's talk about when can you access super. I guess that's the first thing, and that's governed by the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act, or CIS Act is what they call it. And uh, being able to access super is called a condition of release. So you've got to meet the condition of release. So let's talk about then the three ways in which you can meet that condition of a release. Uh, And one of them is by uh, reaching your preservation age. Uh, The preservation age is the age uh, on which you can start to access super. And so for most people uh, that were born after 1 July 1964, it's 60 years of age. So if once you turn 60, you can start accessing super um, and you have ceased employment and you have no intentions of being re-employed in the future. Uh, if you uh, were born before 1 July uh, 1964, um, say between that date and 1960, uh, your preservation age will be somewhere between 55 and 60. It's scaled. Uh, and if you're born before 1 July 1960, uh, your preservation age is 55. So for most people listening, if you're 60 and you retire, you can access super. Uh, if you've eat, reached a preservation age and you're younger than 65 but you're still working, uh, you, you're able to still access some of your super and that's called a transition to retirement income stream. So you can take between the minimum and the maximum of 10% of your balance each year even if you continue to work but you've reached a preservation age. Uh, and the third option is if you are older than 65, you can access it irrespective of your employment status. Now, they're the three conditions of release contained in the CIS Act, but as I said at the beginning, uh, some super funds can impose additional rules and additional restrictions about when you can access your balance and what you can do with it, particularly if you're a member of a defined benefit fund. 
Uh, so while, again, whilst these are generalisations, always important to check with your uh, super fund. But if you're w- with one of the industry super funds, for example, the larger sort of more well more well known ones, uh, you can be pretty confident that that, that they'll be uh, their their minimum requirements are aligned with what the CIS Act says. Okay, so once you've uh, achieved your or met your condition of release, you've then got two options. So let's say that you're 60, you've retired, uh, you have no intention of returning to employment. Uh, in that situation, you've got two options. You can withdraw the full super balance in a lump sum, so you take all your money, or you can start what's called a uh, income stream, uh, a pension income stream, uh, which means that you take a set percentage uh, each year um, out from your withdrawal from your super and typically enough to obviously fund living expenses and so forth. Uh, of course, if you're uh, a member of a defined benefit fund as opposed to defined contribution, which is your normal standard accumulation fund, uh, you could have other options such as take a index lifetime pension, those sorts of things. I won't talk much about defined benefit funds, mainly because they're not that common these days. Uh, and uh, no, no two funds are the same, so it's going to be different for kind of everyone, if you like. Okay, so if you decide to take a full, um, your super is a full lump sum, uh, and, and some people might be contemplating this, some property investors, for example, might be contemplating this um, as a way of reducing debt, reducing property investment debt. So their strategy might be to give very heavily whilst they're working, And when they stop working, use some of their super to reduce debt. So if you do that, um, depending on your components of your super, there's a a taxable untaxed and a taxable taxed element. Uh, This is where it gets confusing. You may pay tax up to a rate of 17% on your lump sum benefit. So there's some tax to pay if you take it all out in one lump sum. Again, it's going to depend on the components of your superannuation. That's where it gets a little bit tricky. Um, But, of course, a a financial advisor or registered tax agent can obviously help you with that. Um, uh, Given, though, there's a a big advantage with leaving as much wealth inside super, typically, or almost always, I should say, I would recommend people start a income stream pension rather than withdrawing a lump sum amount. But, again, it just depends on the components of super and what taxation outcomes and their strategy might look like. Okay, so if we've just summarised then, if we're 60, we've decided we're going to retire fully, not no intention to return to work, and then we've decided to take a income stream from our super, how does that all work? Well, you can start a uh, income income stream by rolling rolling over your accumulation account into what's called a pension account. So if you are with an industry super fund, for example, uh, you will notice they will have super and they will have pension in terms of options, uh, two sort of product options, if you like. You can roll over up to $1.7 million into our pension account. Uh, This 1.7 is called the transfer balance cap. Uh, It's a lifetime cap. So, you know, once you've used that 1.7, you don't have to use it all in one, one tranche. But once you've used it, uh, you know you, you you can no longer roll any more money into a pension account. If you have more than one point seven of super, uh, lucky you, uh, well then you're going to have one point seven in a pension account, and then the rest will remain continue to remain in the accumulation account. Okay, so let, let's talk then about pension accounts and and the attractiveness of them. Well, firstly, the the first thing to note is it's a zero tax rate environment. So you don't pay any tax on investment earnings or capital gains uh, that that account accumulates. Uh, You can roll over $1.7 million today, and of course, if it's well invested, maybe it's worth $2.5 million in, I don't know, let's say 10 years' time, uh, you still don't pay any any tax on that amount, uh, even though it's exceeded 1.7. So 1.7 is the, the original principal amount that you roll over. Uh, and then any earnings uh, are fine. They can stay in that uh, pension account. Uh, if you uh, start a pension, uh, obviously if you have a pension account, you have to, by law, withdraw the minimum amount uh, each year. And it depends on your age. So if you're um, between 60 and 65, it's 4%. If you're between 65 and 74, it's 5%. Uh, and then it's staggered. It increases from there. So you've got to at least withdraw 4% of your balance 
uh, the balance as at 1 July at the beginning of the financial year, uh, each of the each year that you're in pension phase. And if you don't do that, you're a non-complying uh, fund then and, and that attracts a penalty tax rate. I should point out there's no maximum. So you can, it's 4% at least if you're 60, but you can take out 100% or you, from your pension account or you can take out 50%. So you can still take out lump sums if you like. Um, again, typically my advice is try and preserve as much super so it lasts as long as possible and you preserve as much of your assets inside a zero tax environment as possible. So typically I try and advise clients to take out the minimum and really use assets outside super first to, again, to preserve that zero tax environment. Any income that you take as a pension from an income stream pension is tax free in your personal hands. So you don't pay personal income tax. So if I'm taking 4% and that equals $40,000 a year, that $40,000 is tax-free. I don't pay any tax on it. So there's no tax inside super and then there's no tax outside super. Really can't get much better than that. Now, one of the problems that some lucky people might have is they might think, okay, Stuart, I've got my super, but I don't really need to draw it yet. You know, either I'm, you know, I've got other investment income, other assets, whatever it might be. Uh, in that situation, if it's possible, I would still uh, advise a client to turn on a pension. And the reason that you want to turn on that pension as soon as possible is because of that zero tax environment. Um, so no tax on investment earnings this year, but also capital gains tax, no capital gains. So that's important too. Um, uh, but that means if you're drawing money out of super that you don't really need, of course, the negative associated with that is that you're reducing the amount of wealth you have in that zero tax environment. Well, if you've got less than 1.7 million of super in total and you're younger than 74, uh, it's likely that you'll be able to make what's called non-concessional contributions into super. Um, uh, so non-concessional contribution is an after-tax contribution, so really just taking your savings and putting it in super. And individuals uh, have a cap, a non-concessional cap of $110,000 a year. So in that example where my super pension's forty grand and I'm taking $40,000 out of super, if I don't need it, I can put it back in, into super. Now, if you're aged between 67 and 74, you might need to meet the work test, uh, which is 40 hours of work over 30 consecutive days. So if you are between this age bracket, you'll need to consider that. Uh, those non-concessional contributions will go into a accumulation account because a pension account can't receive new contributions. And then what you do is just roll over again from the accumulation into your pension account. So the, the short summary of that is that if you're um, attracted to starting an income stream pension uh, because of the zero tax rate environment, that's a good strategy. If, if you're worried that you're taking money out of super and you're draining the, that resource pool, uh, then potentially there might be a way to get it back in there. Of course, because it's so complex, you really should get some personalised advice. Uh, so in summary, if you retire at 60, you must draw 4% from super. Your super balance is then uh, attack, attracts a zero tax rate, uh, and the income that you withdraw from uh, super is uh, also tax-free. Okay, so let's talk about how you fund those pension payments then. Uh, because it's going to depend on what your super superannuation arrangements look like. So if your super is invested with an industry super fund or a retail fund or something similar like that, you really don't have to worry about funding pension payments. The, the super fund will look after liquidity of doing that. Uh, they will just simply withdraw the amount from your account uh, and your account will hopefully be invested in an appropriate pre-mixed investment option such as balanced, for example, uh, and you don't need to worry about it, it's fine. If you have a self-managed super fund or wrap products, you will need to consider how to fund pension payments uh, by selling down investments or making sure you've got a enough of a cash balance. Uh, now, this is particularly important if you have a self-managed super fund that has invested in direct residential or commercial property um, because what that impact can have uh, because of the compounding growth in property, particularly good property. Um, it extends the asset balance of the super fund. So that's good. That's a good outcome. But of course, property is a liquid. You know, you can't just go and sell 5% because you need to fund some pension payments. Uh, so what you might have in a fund that really has a lot of liquid assets like property, 
um, that you could have a big amount to fund from a pension, from a minimum pension perspective, but those assets are all tied up in illiquid assets and that can create some some problems. So again, if you sort of fall into that category, that's one of the planning considerations that you're going to need to take into account uh, as you get closer to retirement. Of course, for most of my clients, they're funding pension payments from a combination of uh, income, uh, investment income, interest dividends, rental, so forth, plus potentially a gradual sell down of investments uh, if they've got other liquid investments. But of course, that's something that your financial advisor will be able to advise upon and uh, assist with. Let's finish off today's topic with the million dollar question, excuse the pun, um, but how much super do you need? Because it's a it's a common question. It is a bit difficult to answer because um, what you need to tell me is, you know, when, when will you retire and how much do you need and, and do you have any other assets that are going to contribute to towards paying for living expenses? So what is the balance that super needs to make up? Uh, and all of those sort of factor in. But essentially... Uh, most couples would spend somewhere in the range of eighty to hundred thousand dollars a year, um, excluding big holidays, so big expenses. You know, you might do a European trip every four years or something along those lines, or, or you might do it every year, but it's on top of that eighty to hundred thousand. Um, I have a link in the show notes on the blog on the website uh, to a calculator on the government's uh, My Money, or oh, sorry, Money Smart website. Uh, and essentially, all you do is uh, put in your current balance, your income, uh, etc. There's some other details that you can pop in there. It will uh, then project what your balance will be by the time you you reach retirement age. Again, you put that in there. Uh, and then if you just multiply that amount by 4%, uh, that's how much money you're going to get from super uh, in terms of a pension. If you take the minimum pension... Uh, and that's all you take. Your mo- your money will pretty much last forever. You know, well beyond a hundred years if you if you live lucky enough to live that long. So, um, and then what you need to do is then work out well if that four percent isn't enough, you've either got to uh, invest in assets in addition to super or uh, make additional contributions. But you can have a play around with that calculator. The, the answer is going to be different for for different people, and it depends on, as I said, the overall asset position. Now, my view is that it's uh, preferable uh, for people to fund retirement from a variety of sources, not just uh, super pensions. Uh, So typically what I like to see for my clients is that we're going to receive some money from property rental, uh, some money from uh, dividends and interest, you know, from assets and investments uh, that are held outside super, and then plus super pensions. And the reason I like uh, not to be solely relying on one source is obviously to spread my eggs across different baskets. And it means that it gives me some flexibility where I can m- maybe turn off a super pension if I don't want it, or I want to preserve money there, or um, or, the, or the reverse, you know, uh, use super solely for a, a period of time so I preserve the other assets in my personal name. It just allows me to navigate volatility and change in circumstances. Okay, so there you go. Uh, Super, not necessarily a very exciting topic, but important to understand at a high level how it does help you retire and uh, and how it works and what the the restrictions are. Anyway, uh, I hope you've enjoyed the 200th episode and until next week, bye for now.